Next topic to talk about. Let's get into Kevin Saunderson's views on race because this is going to be an interesting one because I'm conflicted, conflicted, conflicted about some of the statements that have been made. And I don't really know where I sit on this, but I do know that it's not fully just a thing about let's just get more black people involved in the scene. It's it's a bit more of a, it's a complex issue that requires a, more of a nuanced answer. I don't think it's black and white, right? This is my interpretation of it, but... Um, on Techno Twitter, this article was, you know, lighting up the timeline, right? Everyone was talking about it. People were saying that they were crying. People were saying it touched their heart. People were saying that they wanted to stab themselves with a turntable needle. It was all the rage, right? All the rage. And um, there's a lot of truth to what Kevin Saunders is saying, right? Um, a pioneer in the scene who essentially feels as if he's been left out of the conversation when it comes to being a legend or a legacy act within the techno music industry, right? Especially if you look at other genres and how they treat their legacy, quote, older acts, he feels as if he's being sort of like, you know, um, put out to pasture, um, overlooked for essentially younger, fresher talent. And in some cases, talent that happens to be the same age as him, but have a different complexion. Really interesting points regarding the whole interview. I'll read some bits of it now to kind of give you a bit of an idea, but I've also written down some of my own points regarding um, the entire issue and what's going on. So let's read some points here, get through the thing. So there's the interview. So it says, da, 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 da. this is interesting. One interesting, another interesting kind of introduction to everything that's going on. The interviewer asked him the following. When you were pioneering electronic music in the 80s, did it feel in, uh, distinctively racial or distinctly a product of black culture? Or was that just not something that was crossing your mind? And Kevin answers, music was very segregated at that time. When I started making music, musically you had R&B radio, you had pop radio, and most tracks were rock and roll and very pop and by white artists. Black artists would be on R&B stations. When we started creating the sound, um, it was only black people who were listening to the music that was being made by myself, Dwan, Aikins, Derek, um, Eddie, folks, and Blake Baxter. The handful of people in Detroit who were making this music were all black artists. We had a handful of people who came out of dance music from like, uh, who came out to dance, like 600 to 700 people who'd come out just about every party. It was all black, simple as that. The great thing about Europe was that they had a different approach. Is if your shit was uh, hot, they'd love your music and they embraced it. That's what um, ignited techno. But then when I got here, when, but when I got there in America, the things that they, the first things they said was, we love your music but you have to go through the R&B division first. That was so weird to me. I was like, what are you talking about? These records for everybody. It doesn't even fit into R&B radio. It doesn't mean black people won't like it, but we should just go across the broad. Um, this just, uh, let's just put the record out and let the people make the choice. I got a lot of type of stuff. I got a lot of that type of stuff during those days, which again is very disconcerting, right? This idea that there's such a, but again, it kind of echoes the same experience that James Baldwin had, right? The idea that he was always confronted with this issue of race when he was back home and the moment he migrated across to uh, Paris for a, a few years to go and live right and fall in love he essentially was met with a system that was classist but wasn't racist in the same way it is in America right he was able to for the first time be respected or be looked upon as a public intellectual without it being a without it being ascribed being a black public intellectual and I guess artists in different areas, in different genres, we're going through exactly the same thing that he's going through, right? Saying, like, coming to Europe, you're one thing, go back to America, it's another thing, completely. So I completely get him on that point. Next question. Um, obviously, mainstream dance music... Um, exploded in popularity in the states during the last decade within the context of that boom uh, did you observe a significant racial disparity he says it grew into a multi-billion dollar industry it grew into festive these festivals so much came from our imprint on this music that led to other influences that led to the music being made by whoever was inspired which is fine america's take on it at the least previously was that this music was made by europeans on white people only or white people only and that black people just didn't touch it because it didn't fit into r&b or hip-hop and it didn't have the same soul or feeling i think it became very commercialized with edm and you had all these managers working with different promoters and bringing the acts in and trying to create a gimmick even the kentucky fried chicken thing that happened at ultra music festival is the greatest of music very very true um, and then next one, talking about EDM, what's a bit I wanted to talk about? There's a bit here that I thought was very of note. Da, 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 da. Ba, 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 ba. Do you have an account? Uh, so anyway, let me read my point. So the whole, this is kind of the whole premise of the whole argument, right? But he's got another touching point. But let me read some of my points that I kind of wrote down here regarding the entire article that I thought would be of note. Let's go back to the top here for you guys. So these are my points regarding the join, sorry, the Kevin Saunderson interview. So um 
there is an issue here about um, trying. Is it possible? Because same as the conversation I had about football, there has to be a point where, as an artist in any genre, especially regardless of if the roots of the genre or the musical, yeah, because the roots doesn't. It, it's hard, isn't it? Really, when something gets whitewashed, how do you get it back to its roots? Is can you actually reverse that? Is that possible? Would you want that to happen? I don't know, but let's just operate with. Let's just operate in the idea that the world is as it is and you have to kind of operate in it at the moment, right? You can't necessarily create this thing out of thin air or recreate this thing out of thin air. You just have to operate in the world as is. If that's the case, it, there is a part of me that thinks you need to be your own worst critic and sort of evolve and maybe develop your sound in some way, shape or form to fit in with what's going on at the moment. Again, it's annoying. It doesn't really line up with the artist's integrity. It's probably not something a lot of people want to do, especially if you're an older act. Why should you do that? You essentially lay the blueprint. I understand those points. But if you do, because again, most of Kevin Swanson's um, complaints come from the idea that he isn't playing the big festivals, the big clubs. It's not necessarily he's not able to make a career. That's a different conversation. If he wasn't able just to make a living, uh, playing music or creating music that he loves, that would be a concern. But he feels that he's not getting the same looks as like a Sven Var, right? Which is an f- unfair comparison because Sven Var, you know, is a bit of an anomaly in that case. Um, but it's just, it, I don't know. Like, can you not look at yourself a little bit in the mirror and say, what could I do to maybe adapt to what's going on? And if you don't want to adapt, is there also a question of just doing your own thing and allowing the people that like you for that thing that you do to support you and the people that don't? They don't. It is what it is. But if you want to go play in the big leagues, it's sort of like complaining that if you... It's sort of complaining. Yeah, I say the same sort of thing. If you went to have a pop number one record, but you didn't want to make a pop record, that wouldn't make any sense, in it? Right? Part of the reason why you'd want to make a song that would be number one the worldwide, right, would be because... Part of the reason why you'd do that is because you'd want to exercise that part of your artistic arsenal, right? Do I have the ability to make generic run-of-the-mill background music in a shopping mall but for some people they couldn't do it but if you want to do that there's some things you have to do you have to compromise yourself in some way shape or form so i think some of these legacy acts probably are unwilling to do that because again they have a legitimate reason man they they essentially invented a genre of music right i understand it but i think part of the kind of friction from this comes from that another point uh gather data this is something I think was mentioned in an article I read uh, maybe a couple of days ago regarding the idea of inclusivity in fashion and somebody on the board of the CFDA, a black lady, made a really good point about you no know, having to, trying to understand exactly what's going on, gathering the necessary data points so that you can address the issues that need to be addressed and then the things that we think are the issue sometimes the data won't reflect that and now you see a lot in sports right sometimes people would say one thing about a player but then the data um you know says a completely different thing so you have to kind of marry those two things up like gather the data like who um is there a demand for um more inclusivity in lineups regardless right and then you can poll people whatever it may be um what's available out there how many people of a certain talent level are there to pick from or are they base or say back oh, there's all these conversations need to be had around that right and then from there you can really enact some change i think so um the other one um it's an argument for the whole like you know one it's maybe your fault thing right um supposedly there's there was one hundred and thirty thousand techno records released on beatport alone right so it does show there's an appetite for that music it's not as if like customers are getting tired or have fatigue over new tunes right new subgenres are popping up every single day so there's obviously a demand for it it's just about how you try to align your vision your artistic output with what people want like there has to be some sort of marriage some sort of conversation regarding that um secondly another point promoters and club owners are partly to blame it's a boys club where they look after each other which is great if you're friends with them but bad if you're trying to break through um but in their defense they're only looking uh, at what contributes their bottom line so this is a really important part of it because promoters and, and booking agents like or whatever they may be they hold a uh, insane amount of influence and power in the scene it really is frightening if you think about it because there's probably enough clubs to go around for everyone to play in i would say just of just of you know off the top of my head there's probably enough nightclubs out there for everyone to have a career in music i think the problem comes when your uh, ambitions it are you know you want to be the next tiesto or something right that's when it gets a bit tricky because there's there's only enough room for a certain amount of those people to do that thing right but if you want to have a career making music and djing around the world i think most people could do it especially if you're good right it can be done but the issue is that 
the most of these especially the, the festivals that you want to go to or the clubs that you want to go to they're controlled or managed by a small group of promoters and agents who essentially look after each other right which isn't a bad thing i think if you've ever been at a party or a wedding right where there's been a terrible dj playing there you know that the disparity in DJing is really, really wide, right? It goes from crappy wedding DJ to a really amazing guy playing records, vinyl records in like some dingy pub somewhere in the middle of Bethnal Green, right? There's no knowing. It's like, a, it's like a flip of a coin because like I've always said, DJing is like the lowest barrier of entry in terms of getting into the entertainment industry, right? If you want to be an actor, you know, again, you have to, you know, dedicate yourself to that crowd for an X number of years. Maybe do some stage time. You want to be a singer, you have to sing. Rapper, you have to know how to rap uh being a band you got to know how to play an instrument but djing just requires you know a couple of you know hours watching a couple of youtube uh videos and just essentially spending hours trying to beat match the same record right on a midi player or on virtual dj via your desktop it doesn't it's not hard to uh, essentially start um your career in djing so with that said there's going to be a lot more people right it's just it's just oversubscribed it's just too many djs right not the ones that want to make it don't get me wrong but just too many doing it regardless which then creates you know a, a hard it's hard just to break through in general i think for most people i don't even think it's a black or white thing i think there's a lot of white artists out there who are you know desperately trying to break through desperately trying to con connect with labels and again absolutely no love especially the ones that are mainly producers and that you know happen to dj because they just want to get more gigs it's difficult for everybody out there i think in the most part but i think the issue is that the promoters and the booking agents need to diversify their lineups they're just too lazy they just take the easy option um they don't try and take any risks um they're afraid of effectively having no one turn up because they're not booking the same old lineup they booked five years ago it's a really weird way to kind of um sustain or to maintain this scene that we all know and love really because you know if you don't keep it fresh if you don't introduce new voices new new talent you're essentially going to contribute to this stuff dying out over the next few years but anyway next one um is there a market for legacy techno acts apart from sven by maybe a few other you know there's a few more of those carl craigs and everybody else included um who else from that era can headline a big club festival and sell tickets um is there if there's no appetite for it some legacy acts will have to lower the expectations and be okay to play max capacity 500 people rooms um it's not red bull money but it's still great living that's the thing it's just trying to align your expectations like what do you actually want from it if you want to be headlining big festivals year in year out it's going to take something from you as well right you have to compromise some part of your artistry you're gonna to have to do things that you're probably not comfortable to do in order to kind of maintain that level of um exposure in the market if you just want to have a career and just tour i think it's possible to do as a legacy act it really is maybe you have to just gonna take a dent in your ego you might have to play a couple of room twos here and there and be a warm-up act here and there but you could do it so it really is that that's the question for her because i think and again is there is there an appetite for legacy acts do people within the techno or electronic music space do they want to go and see some of the people who are fundamental who are kind of cause again because no one knows the history of techno really right the especially the black history of techno the detroit history of techno do they actually know it um this, this has got a very european slant for the most part the history you know starts and ends at you know trezor or something so that's maybe a wider conversation about how do you re-educate a consumer base that essentially only knows techno through the prism of Europe. They don't know it through from the American side of things. That's an interesting point to kind of um, really think about. And again, it's a nuanced answer, complex answer, complex questions require complex answers. Another one, um, is it more of an issue in America than Europe? Because I don't know what, because for the most part, from what you can tell in the article, it does seem like Kevin Swanson is complaining more so about the American market, which is, you know, still in its, it's I wouldn't say it's not in, in its infancy, but it's still trying to, you know, figure out where exactly what electronic music means in, a, in, in America, right? Is it EDM? Is it LA house and disco culture? Is it um the sort of i don't know the avant-garde queer alternative scene in in the east coast like what is it really like you don't really know you don't can't really put a button a finger on it so i think that's a question that needs to be said and again can you really expect a coachella to know um the heritage of techno or electronic music and have those artists headline a stage or something i don't necessarily think that's fair will they that's not their per, that's not within their purview it requires maybe some more grassroots operations to maybe give them that platform um, in order to kind of get the message out in a wider way. And then maybe if somebody, <coughs> <coughs> sorry, 
somebody from that team on the Coachella side sees it, they can maybe, you know, lend a helping hand and maybe extend the invitation for that kind of bigger platform. Another one. Uh, la, 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 la. Um, oh, the bit about the, yeah, the bit that hurt me most was the bit about the promoter, right? It's a, it's a really brutal part, which kind of echoes a lot of experience. I think a lot of people have had when you try and get in a gig because there needs to be said also out loud, then getting gigs is really difficult, regardless of your background, man. Getting a gig, being able to play in a club is super hard. Like I said, there's so many people out there DJing, um, especially crap people, right? People that have no business being behind decks, that are just wasting people's times. Um, people that essentially give us a bad name, right? They come unprepared, they get smashed behind the decks. They don't play in, with the appropriate volume. They don't read the room. Just completely, complete amateur shows, right? That basically um, lead to some promoters or bar owners being a little bit picky about who they let play in their bar or club. So it results in us kind of fighting, scrapping, pulling each other's eyes out for crappy $100 gigs, right? That um, are crappy, but they're the only way that we get to play out in front of a crowd and get that experience. Again, um, DJing, much like comedy, you can't learn to DJ at home in your bedroom. You sort of can fundamentals, right? You can maybe learn how to do set up punchline, whatever it may be at home. But in order to really know if you're funny, in order to really know if those jokes are going to land, you need to do it in front of an audience. Same with the DJ. In order to know if that transition is going to work, if that mix makes sense, if what you're playing is good, you're going to have to go out there and play in front of people. But it's just hard to just do it in the first place. So to hear Kevin Saunders, an absolute legend with 30 plus years in the game, having to go through the same things I go through is a madness. So this is one of the, um, where is it? Uh, it's a the, the buddy, buddy, buddy is a really mad when he said yeah i was upset where is it da, 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 kind of, yeah this one um uh, yeah so this is and the question here is about um do you feel like the people who produce the biggest dance events let's say ultra edc or coachella have a responsibility to book more black artists right and he says a quite easy answer here i said i think so the problem is that many of the people in power in these companies don't really care and they don't really know um some of these uh some of them also came in after the fact that they don't care about the history or integrity of the music they care about the money so yeah they've got a responsibility to correctly represent the culture they're profiting from but responsibility in their mind is only to make money which i've always kind of understood i I think when you go to most of these festivals you do get an understanding that it is at some way in some point it is like a kind of a flex for the person that putting it on just because you know the the finance the economy the the economics of putting together a festival especially ones with like big headliners playing you're not going to make that much money on unless you're really really clever with what you're doing most of people are just doing it because they just want to do it right it's like a rich rich man's toy play thing whatever it may be um and you get the feeling that they don't really care they're just you know they're essentially trying to put on a party for their friends essentially on a really high level but just trying to put on a party their friends and here this experience that um, Kevin had with one of these big agency people, right? So it's another, it's a part that really kind of broke my heart. So it's a thing. He says, a question, have you had any personal experiences with that type of thinking? And Kevin says, I talked to a gentleman at one of the leading global agencies. A promoter friend told me to call him because I re recreated um, in a city and we were going back to the, on the road and we did some touring and we were working on a new album. I thought, let me get the US agent who's got some power and has a good roster. I left a message and he called me back, which is a great, right? Imagine in a city going on a tour, they're back together. It would be flipping amazing. You could do some really interesting stuff around where they play, some cool activation some cool radio spots like it's be a great idea in principle and here hear how it went so here's kevin's words so the guy i'm talking to him and he was like hey how can i help you and i said this is kevin saunderson and i wanted to talk to you about maybe doing some future business and touring together he said well who are you i don't even know anything about you i don't know who you are and i can imagine how condescending that tone must have been right to an absolute legend because imagine imagine getting left a voicemail by kevin saunderson from inner city right wouldn't you want to google his name and find out if that's actually kevin saunderson that you're thinking of right maybe check out a couple interviews see what he posted recently on twitter you'd want to do some investigation but the arrogance right the gumption of like he probably thought how dare this guy even call me about a gig like does he know who i am it's like oh disgusting and it continues it says the interviewer wow that happened kevin says i was thinking first of all if you call me back, you should really do some research. Um, 
some search really especially if these are top guy at least ask some of your agents he's older than me so he should know the point is that he's he was very arrogant and i didn't know if it was a co a color thing or what but he was like i don't know your music i don't know who you are and we take top artists around this agency it was a bunch of bullshit i was like you shouldn't have ever called me back and this is a waste of my time he didn't even let me finish what i was saying i was giving him some history but uh but uh, but i'm not some old fart who doesn't know what's up uh, i play around the world and understand the music i create this music and as old as i am i'm a futurist still so for him to say we're not interested i was like well i'm not interested either and after having this conversation if you don't have those platforms we have to go through a different agent and we have to start smaller and work our way up so it was a real strange conversation for me even for me recreating his brand and uh, already touring the world doing stuff like glastonbury killing it at glastonbury and in europe i'm still fighting for inner city to move forward as we've restructured the act but how is a young artist supposed to get an opportunity when all you have are these executives at high levels blocking them for whatever reason whether racial or just unaware and again i would i would caution i would say caution on the whole racial thing i just think they don't like you said in the beginning they just don't give a shit they don't care like um it's a boys club like i mentioned they just want to look after their friends and again it happens in all it happens even for up coming djs of all colors and races it's a thing it's just what it is they look after each other and again most of it has come because most of it comes from the purview of like you've been burned too many times giving random people chances and they're terrible and it also comes around the idea of like you just don't want any headaches you want to be able to just book somebody and know that they're going to get the job done because you trust them and you're a friend of yours you don't give anyone else a chance but then it goes into this whole circle jerk thing where you don't let anybody else in it gets a bit clicky and that's when they can become a bit toxic and become um detrimental to the longevity of the scene in general because if you're not having fresh new faces coming in you're not going to have a scene that's going to function later on and especially in this era right with corona happening there's a, there's a lot of djs that have had to go back home to their native countries or people have moved away whatever it may be bars need to then start reaching out to local djs who they've probably been poo-pooing for the most part right they've been you know favoring um, other people from outside of the nation to come and play or maybe have bigger names and paying bigger fees now you're gonna have to rely on you know grassroots local people to actually you know get you back up and running so i thought that was the most heartbreaking part of it anyway going to my notes here blah, 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 last couple of bits um he said yeah and i said oh but we can't go around calling the entire scene racist because it's it's um it isn't it's because it isn't especially in europe it's more complicated than that which is true the american electronic music scene there's obviously a conversation about racism has to be had because you know living in america it is what it is in europe it's a bit more complex there are issues especially in germany you look at their complicated history they have with nazism you look at us in england as well we have a very complicated history with music in general right you look at the rave scene in the 80s that was mostly a, a white um, uprising in that regard and they quote that immediately so it's a very complicated conversation that have to be had between working class people um you know um how you identify with you how you identify yourself really complicated issues need to be had but they're not just under the banner of racism especially in europe i think in my experience and then the last one bubbity bubbity ba um no, I think that's it really on that point. Yeah, I think that's it. But it's a really good interview. I really recommend you check it out. Again, it's a lot of conversations that need to be had regarding the issue of race in electronic music and how we go about addressing it. Again, I've mentioned it previously. I'm not a fan of affirmative action when it comes to lineups. I don't think we should just have for every white person have one black person. I don't think I actually understand. I don't think I guess the root of the problem or addresses it in any meaningful way. Um, it's just tokenism in my experience or from what I know. Um, I'm also not, uh, not a big fan of the 50-50 gender splits either. I don't think that's beneficial either i think there needs to be a conversation around how we actually have the dance floors reflected in the dj booth and vice versa how we have a conversation around providing safe spaces we have a conversation around you know um uh drug safety loads of real conversation needs to be had right um that needs to take place in a in a um, in an environment where people don't feel as if they're like being cornered into a position where or being you know called out of their name because essentially they don't ascribe to a certain viewpoint that makes them racist i don't think that's a really beneficial way to go about the conversation and again i could be wrong but who knows but anyway check it out it's on billboard now uh it's called uh dance music kevin pioneer uh dance music pioneer kevin Swanson, the scene is still falling failing black artist sorry um it's on billboard i'll link in the show notes for you guys so check out yourself it's on the it'll be in the description make sure you check it down below for you to read it yourself